By the 1800s, slavery had become so rooted into economic, political, and social life in America. Cotton accounted for half the value of all American exports after 1840, and the South had developed into an oligarchy, oligarchy controlled by the few rich plantation owners. Only a fourth of white Southerners actually owned slaves. The majority of whites in the South were poor farmers. Although there is no doubt that slavery was a horrible institution, slaves in the Deep South had a pretty stable fami family life and had developed a distinct culture by the 1840s and 50s. Slaves combined African and Christian elements to form their own form of religion. However, the cruelties of slavery could not be denied. The abolitionist movement started to take on greater, mo greater momentum in the 1830s with the Second Great Awakening. William Lloyd Garrison inspired the American Anti-Slavery Society when he published his anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, and Fred Frederick Douglass, one of the greatest black abolition abolitionists, gave stunning speeches after escaping from slavery himself. In 1836, the, the South was starting to fear for the future of its peculiar institution and drove through Congress the gag resolution which requir required all anti-slavery petitions to be tabled without debate. At this time, although there were many abolitionists, the majority of people in the North were still undecided about their position on slavery. When Whig candidate William Henry Harrison won the presidency in the 1840 election, the Whig party leaders like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster were, el were elated to have an executive that would pass their legislation. However, Harrison died a month into his presidency and was replaced by his de Democratic vice president, John Tyler. The Whigs pushed for a nationalistic program, including higher tariffs and another Bank of the United States, but Tyler vetoed the bank proposal and the majority of other Whig legislation because the Whigs were unwilling to compromise enough with Tyler. The 1844 election was seen as a mandate for manif manifest destiny with the election of James K. Polk. Before Tyler left office, he started the process of acquiring Texas through a joint resolution that required only a majority vote to pass in both houses. It passed early in 1845, and Texas was invited into the Union. Polk also wanted to buy California from Mexico, but after Texas joined the Union, relations with Mexico were ruined. In 1846, war was declared on Mexico after Mexican troops crossed the Rio Grande and attacked American troops who were stationed there. American war operations against Mexico were completely successful, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848. In 1849, the discovery of gold in California sent a rush of pioneers out west, hoping to strike it rich. Because it filled with people so quickly, California bypassed the territory stage and applied for a statehood in 1849 after writing a constitution that excluded slavery. The admission of California as a free state brought up bitter debates in Congress by Southerners who did not want to balance in Congress to be tipped. In 1850, a compromise was finally struck after Henry Clay and Daniel Webster made powerful speeches, urging the two sides to compromise. In the end, California was admitted as a free state, but the Fugitive Slave Law was passed. In addition, popular sovereignty was adopted for the new territories from Mexico. In 1854, Stephen Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed settlers in the Kansas and Nebraska territories to choose for themselves whether to be a slave or a free state. This act encountered much controversy because it repealed the Missouri Compromise of 1820. The Kansas-Nebraska Act produ produced the new Republican Party, which was strongly anti-slavery. In 1854, Commodore Matthew Perry traveled to Japan and ended its two-century-long isolationism by negotiating a treaty that established consular relations. When Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe, many eyes were opened to the cruelties of slavery. Millions of copies were sold in America and abroad. Under the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the South, the South thought it was understood that Kansas would become a slave state, but abolitionists poured into the territory. In 1856, John Brown, an abolitionist, attacked five pro-slavery Southerners, starting a feud between Northerners and Southerners in Kansas that would later merge with the Civil War. 
In 1857, Northerners were outraged by the su Supreme Court's de decision in the Dred Scott case. It decreed that, the, that a slave was private property and could be taken into any territory and legally held in slavery, even if the territory was above the 3630 line. It went on to say that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional because Congress had no power to ban slavery from the territories. In 1858, the campaign for the Illinois Senate seat reached a national spotlight with the debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. Lincoln railed against the Dred Scott decision and popular sovereignty. Although Douglas beat Lincoln in the election, Lincoln became a prominent national politician. He was nominated as the Republican candidate for the 1860 presidential election and sweepingly won almost all the northern electoral votes, enough to win him the election. Immediately after Lincoln won, South Carolina became the first state to secede, and ten more would follow its example to form the Confederate States of America. In 1861, South Carolina fired the first shots of war at Fort Sumter after Lincoln's Senate provisions. No lives were lost, but the South had clearly started the war. The South had some advantages coming into the Civil War, but it had far more disadvantages. It possessed the most talented officers and was fighting on its own soil, but it had supply problems, a rickety transportation system, a weak, a weak economy, and a pro-states rights government. The North had incompetent generals at first and inexperienced soldiers, but it had a huge economy, the majority of the wealth, railroads, a superior navy, and a bigger population. Because Britain depended on, on southern cotton for its factories, the South th thought it would aid their cause. However, it did not. In previous years, there had been a surplus of cotton, and Britain was able to find other sources. In addition, the Union was supplying Britain with food that it desperately needed, and it would not allow Britain to help the Confederacy. Although the North was wealthier than the South, it still had money issues, but it found ways to avoid severe inflation. It levied the first ever income tax that was very low, but brought in millions of dollars. J. Cook and Company raised $2 billion through the sale of bonds. Also, the national banking system was established in 1863, which was the first step, taking to step taken toward a unified banking system since Andrew Jackson killed the bank in 1836. At the beginning of the Civil War, the North, including President Lincoln, expected the war to be a quick victory for the Union. However, the first battle at Bull Run was a disaster for the Union. This loss forced the North to, to buckle down and prepare for a long war because it shattered the quick victory illusion, while it made the Confederates dangerously overconfident. After the disastrous Peninsula Campaign, Lincoln began to draft the Emancipation Proclamation because he refused to let the Confederate States back into the Union with slavery after all the damage they had caused. The first major victory for the Union came at the Battle of Antietam, which allowed Lincoln to throw down the Emancipation Proclamation and kept Britain and France from aiding the Confederacy. The twin victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg sealed the South's doom, and it was only a matter of time before the Union won. In 1865, four years after the fighting started, northern troops captured the Confederate capital of Richmond and cornered Lee's troops, forcing him to surrender. Five days after the Confederate surrender, Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Although the South cheered at first, they soon realized it was a calamity for them because Lincoln did not want to punish the South, but Congress, on the other hand, did. After the war, many Southerners remained dangerously defiant toward the Union and still believed their view of secession was correct. Even before the South surrendered, the war over Reconstruction began between Lincoln and Congress. Lincoln came up with his 10% plan, which said that a state could be reintegrated when 10% of its voters pledged to follow emancipation and take an oath of allegiance to the Union. But Congress thought it was too lenient. It proposed the Wade Davis Bill, where 50% of the voters took an oath of allegiance and demanded stronger safeguards for emancipation. When Andrew Johnson succeeded Lincoln for the presidency, Congress thought he would agree with their plan, but he created his own version of Lincoln's plan. This led to inevitable clashes between Johnson and Congress. 
When Johnson announced in late 1865 that the southern states were ready to be readmitted into the Union according to his Reconstruction Plan, Congress was outraged. The southern states had virtually re-enslaved blacks with the passage of the Black Codes, and once they came back into Congress, they could overthrow Republican dominance. In 1868, Johnson was impeached by the House, but was acquitted by the Senate. His impeachment made him just a figurehead, since Congress could override anything he vetoed. In 1877, Reconstruction in the South officially ended when all military troops were removed.